Welcome everyone and thank you for attending this month's science seminar presented by the NSF's National Ecological Observatory Network, which is operated by Battelle. As people are trickling in, I'm just going to do some general announcements before we get started. Our goal with this monthly series of talks is to build community among researchers at the intersection of ecology, environmental science, and NEON. We are very excited to have Sarah Shivers and Keely Roth from Planet here to speak with us today. Um, but before we turn it over to them, a few logistics. We have enabled optional automated closed captioning for today's talk. If you would like to use that, find the CC button in your Zoom menu bar. The webinar will consist of a presentation followed by Q&A. As you think of questions, please add them to the Q&A box. There is also a chat box which we can use to share links with each other, introduce yourself, um, general networking or, or comments, but we'll put questions in the Q&A box. And then at the end, when the presentation is done, we'll facilitate discussion, and there will also be an opportunity to ask questions over audio if you'd like to do so by raising your hand. NEON welcomes contributions from everyone who shares our values of unity, creativity, collaboration, excellence, and appreciation. This is outlined in our Code of Conduct, and these guidelines apply to NEON staff as well as participants external to the NEON program. Please do review our Code of Conduct, which can be found on our science seminars Web page. I'm just going to kind of scroll down to the bottom here where you can find our code of conduct and check this out for yourself. Um, this talk will be recorded and made available for asynchronous viewing after the fact. We hope to have that posted to our web page, usually about a week after the talk. And to complement our monthly science seminars, we host related data skills webinars on how to access and use NEON data. Registration for those is available on our science seminars webpage, which I will put in the chat momentarily. But if you scroll down to the bottom, here's the data skills webinars and the one coming up later in May is extremely exciting and relevant. It's um, how to work with neon hyperspectral data in Google Earth Engine. So we hope to see some of you there. Again, I'll throw the link to register in the chat in a moment. And lastly, we are soliciting nominations for the 2023-2024 round of speakers. So nominate yourself or a colleague today by filling out this form, which is kind of in the near the top here of our science seminars webpage. We would love to hear from you and hear about your research if it's relevant to the seminar. All right, now I will turn it over to Shashi Kondori to introduce today's speakers. Thanks, Samantha. Um, being a remote sensing scientist myself, I'm pretty excited about today's uh, seminar. Uh, on behalf of everyone here at NEON, it is my pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Keely Roth and Dr. Sarah Shores. Um, and before we get started with the talk, I would like to quickly introduce our speakers. Um, so our first speaker for today, Dr. Sarah Shivers, is a senior product manager at Planet. Uh, with a PhD in remote sensing, as well as an experience in management consulting, uh, Dr. Shivers enjoys working at the intersection of science and business. Um, our next speaker, Dr. Keely Roth, is the lead hyperspectral scientist at Planet. Uh, her past research was at the intersection of remote sensing, data science, and plant ecology and ecosystem science. Um, both our speakers, Keely and Sarah, received their PhD in geography from UC Santa Barbara. Uh, in fact, I only found out this yesterday. They even both had the same PhD advisor, Dr. Dar Roberts. Uh, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Sarah. Um, you may please share your screen now. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Shashi, for the introduction. Um, can everyone see my screen OK? Looks great. Perfect. Thank you for confirming that. Um, great. Well, so excited to be here today. Um, thank you so much um, to the NEON team for inviting us. Uh, Keely and I have been um, really excited about this for, for months. Um, and so we'll be taking the, the next um, half hour to 45 minutes to tell you about the mission that we've been working on, um, and then looking forward to taking some questions and having some conversation. Um, so before we begin, um, Shashi already um, gave us um, introductions, but um, just want to say um, int introduction myself. I'm Sarah Shivers. I, I oversee our tasking imagery products at Planet. Um, I've been at Planet for a bit over two years. Um, and our tasking imagery products include our high res imagery products, but also our, our hyperspectral um, imagery products from this new mission that we'll be talking about today. 
Um, and Keely Roth is our lead scientist um, for our hyperspectral mission. So um, we've been uh, closely collaborating on this uh, for a couple of years now. All right, so I, I wanted to start out before I really get into our mission, our hyperspectral mission with, um, with giving a bit of an overview about planet because I imagine not everybody on this webinar is um, deeply familiar with Planet as a company. Um, so who is Planet? Um, what are we all about? Well, at Planet, we're, we're really driven um, by the idea that no matter what your industry or your role or your geography, um, you can't fix what you can't see. Um, and so that's why our mission is to image the whole world every day and make global change visible, accessible, and actionable. Um, what I think is really very cool about Planet, um, in addition to this amazing mission, is that we are a public benefit corporation. And so you can see here um, that we have a purpose as a public benefit corporation, which is to accelerate humanity toward a more sustainable, secure, and prosperous world by illuminating environmental and social change. And so our mission was formalized um, into our PBC purpose when we went public. And this really cements how our business and our impact are aligned together um, and reinforces that as a company, we are really dedicated to bringing value, not just commercially, but also socially and environmentally. So Planet is an integrated aerospace company. Um, we design, build, and operate the largest satellite fleet um, ever. And we also provide online software tools and analytics that we need in order to um, fulfill our mission to make this data actionable and accessible to our users. And so we do this through uh, providing up-to-date satellite data um, and agile infrastructure, through insights and intelligence um, that is built on top of our data, and um, through delivery, automated delivery into various applications and, and workflows. Um, to ensure that um, a variety of users can, can access and use our data. So Planet's fleet today is approximately 200 satellites. Um, and right now we have two distinct classes of satellites. So we have our PlanetScope Dove satellites, which are on the left. Um, those are the satellites that um, really were what Planet was, was founded on. They're about five kilograms or about 11 pounds each. Um, and we like to say um, that they're the size of, of about a bread loaf. Um, that's, a, that's a good way of being able to think about their size. Um, they fly um, a large constellation in order to map the Earth's land masses every day. Um, and they have just under a four meter resolution. So they are small, um, but they are able to accomplish a lot. Um, they circle the Earth in about 90 minutes and take pictures multiple times per second. Um, and our, our Dove satellites have um, eight spectral bands um, for a variety of applications. So these are able to um, image about 85 to 90% of the landmass of the Earth daily. Then we also have our SkySats. Um, we have about 21, or we have 21 right now in orbit. Um, they are much bigger. They're 100 kilograms, um, and they provide responsive tasking. So um, they provide tasking at about a 50 centimeter resolution, so much higher spatial resolution. Um, and they are designed to be really agile. So they can reorient and take a picture of a target in a few seconds. Um, and at this resolution uh, that they're able to provide, you can start to do things like count cars or identify the make of a ship or an aircraft or, um, do something that we do a lot with these, which is to assess like building damage and other types of damage following nat natural disasters. Um, and so it's a combination of these satellites um, that have different types of sensors um, that we think is particularly powerful um, at Planet and something that um, is a large differentiator um, from many of our competitors. So to further our ability to empower our customers get them the information they need. Uh, we are currently working on two new missions um, for launch within the next year um, to add to the suite of capabilities that we already offer that I just talked about. So um, 
Pelican is um, one of these constellations. That's our next generation high resolution um, tasking satellites that will um, follow on to supplement um, and complement our, our SkySat capabilities. And then there's Tanager, um, which is what we're here to talk to you about today. So Tanager will provide hyperspectral data uh, from the visible through the shortwave infrared. Um, and for our customers, and I imagine this audience um, is, is very, familiar, um, very familiar with this, uh, that means the ability to detect subtle features, uh, materials, signals, and changes in our land and waters and atmosphere. So we plan to launch two demonstration satellites first, um, and then follow on um, with, with more satellites to build out a, a more full constellation. So having different types of um, sensors allows us to use the right tool for the job. I think that's what's particularly um, exciting here. And it allows us to tip and queue between our different systems. So uh, for example, because we are looking at all of the Earth's land masses every day uh, with our planet scope data, we're able to detect change in this imagery. We can then use that to cue a either a zoomed in observation um, with our high res imagery, or we can in the future, um, the idea is that we can cue our hyperspectral satellites um, to that area so that then we can better characterize the change that we are seeing um, in our planet scope data. So um, combined potential here with all of our satellites um, is, is particularly exciting, I think. Uh, and so I wanna highlight too that we're, this also um, represents a large step forward in our capabilities. Um, you can see in this slide how um, with time across the spatial, spectral and temporal domains, um, we are really committed to improving our customers' abilities to see what's most important to them. And so Tanager is really representing um, a very large step forward spectrally for planet. And I just realized I said Tanager when I didn't, haven't previously explained that um, Tanager, those are our hyperspectral satellites. On um, the name of our hyperspectral satellites, we uh, like to name things after birds at planet. So we have our, our doves, which are our, um, our planet scope medium res satellites. We have our pelicans upcoming and, and now we have Tanager as well. But Tanager is uh, representing a very large step forward spectrally for planet. So moving from eight bands, um, which is what we have um, through our super doves today um, to over 400 um, spectral bands with Tanager that, that span out into the shortwave infrared. So this constellation was designed with the methane use case in mind. Um, and so this is the driving use case. It drove a lot of our requirements um, because our, one of our goals with this mission is to mitigate methane by being able to detect uh, point source methane emissions um, at a facility level. But when designing this satellite for this purpose, um, the requirements for that made it such that it is really well suited for a uh, broad range of applications. And so we do um, anticipate having customers across many different verticals um, and know that this data is really powerful, um, much beyond the methane use case. Um, so some, some ap example applications um, that I'll name here, but then Keely will go into a lot more detail um, about some of these are things like um, within the ag space, crop identification or um, looking at crop nutrients. Um, think about applications like water quality um, or understanding um, biodiversity in certain areas and tracking change over time. Uh, materials identification um, is a big one in different ways of um, assessing environmental sites. Uh, so broad range of applications um, that, our, that our data will be very useful for. Um, here are some of the key um, performance specs of our system. So um, we'll be flying in low earth orbit um, we're on 400 kilometers. Um, we'll be going into sun synchronous orbit. Um, and so at least for the, the two um, initial tech demonstration satellites, uh, that's the plan. We will have an anticipated um, 
revisit of one to seven days um, with the full constellation. We don't have a finalized um, number of satellites that we'll be putting up. We're putting up more satellites as um, we get more demand for this type of data, but we do have a goal um, of um, hitting daily revisit uh, for certain targets. We'll have a uh, spatial resolution of um, 30, around 30 meters. Um, this is at Nader. These are tasking satellites. Um, so they will be looking off Nader as well. Uh, we have a swath width of, of 18 kilometers. So we'll be able to cover um, a, a good amount of area um, with our collects. The spectral range and sampling um, is similar to the um, imaging spectrometer on, on NEON's AOP um, airborne platform. And so 400 to 2,500 nanometers at five nanometer spacing. Um, and then this will allow for, um, for detection limits um, that you'll see at the bottom here of, for methane and CO2, um, really getting down to the facility level. Um, something I actually skipped over here, but is really critical for talking about is our SNR. Um, so our signal to noise ratio is um, something that is really important for this mission. We're gonna have really high sensitivity, um, particularly important for the methane use case, but really relevant for others as well. Um, and so we are anticipating a, an SNR in the um, methane detection region, so in the shortwave infrared um, of around 300 to 600. Um, so the structure of this mission is really unique and um, Planet is one of many partners that is making this happen. And so I think it's worth um, giving a bit of an overview of some of the, the key partners in this mission um, in addition to, to Planet and how we all operate. Um, this is a public-private partnership, and it spans regulatory, science, technology, nonprofits, and donors. And what this does is it creates a really strong team that will really make this mission a success and drive have the ability to drive action. So Carbon Mapper is a nonprofit organization um, led by Riley Duran. And they are the, the program integrator, and they are also leading the research and advocacy work for the methane and CO2 mitigation. Um, this includes using our data to uh, process it and look for methane and launching a global public data portal um, to show where they find methane emissions in order to increase transparency um, of where there are emissions and really drive action. Um, another major partner of ours is JPL. And so JPL is um, a tech partner for us. And what they are doing is they are building the first spectrometer. So the spectrometer that will go on our, our first Tanager satellite, um, they are actively building that right now. And then they are transferring know-how of how to build spectrometers to the planet team. And the planet team is building um, the second spectrometer and then all subsequent spectrometers. And so that build is actively underway right now as well. Um, this is really exciting partnership um, as JPL is you know, a leading source of knowledge in how to build and design um, really high quality imaging spectrometers. So we are um, really excited about this partnership and, and what it means for our capabilities and for the quality of our system. And then um, our role as Planet is as the commercial data provider um, and as the manufacturer and, and operator of the, the constellations of the constellation. So um, we will be building and offering um, various products, and I'll speak to a, a few of those um, later in this talk. And then we're also owning and, and operating the spacecraft and scaling the constellation. Um, so like I said, that means building um, payloads two through however many, um, and we're, we're also you know, building the bus and, and the full spacecraft. Um, there are various other partners um, listed up here, and I won't go into tons of details um, about what each of them do, um, but it is a really um, exciting way to set up a mission, um, and everyone has their, their own role to play in, um, in making this a success. So very fortunate to, to work with this group. 
Um, so I do want to talk a little bit about the imagery products um, that we're offering um, at launch. And then we do anticipate that with time, we will um, add additional um, imagery products to, to what we're offering. Um, but for um, as we're like approaching launch, the products that we are looking towards and planning to offer, um, we will have our core imagery products um, that are our radiance and reflectance um, data products. And so we'll be offering both of these um, in basic, so not orthorectified, and then ortho products. Um, and these will have the, these are the full, full data cubes um, with the 400 plus spectral bands that I mentioned um, that span from the visible through the shortwave infrared. Um, these will, the, the ortho products will have a 30 meter spatial resolution. Um, and something that I didn't mention on, on the other page, but I think is really um, interesting to note is that we will be able to um, collect imagery and create data products using various imaging modes um, that can optimize for either coverage or SNR. Um, so essentially we can, we can decide that we want to cover um, larger areas faster um, with a more standard SNR, or we can maximize the SNR and um, have shorter collects. And so that flexibility uh, makes it really well suited for, for a variety of use cases. We'll be, um, we're planning to deliver this um, data within one day after collection. So um, pretty fast turnaround time um, to our users. Um, and as mentioned, we have a swath width of 18 kilometers and then the length will um, be variable depending on our, our customer needs. So the area that they're looking at and then the um, mode in which we, we run the satellite to, to meet those needs. So the other data product I wanna talk about um, and, and what the application um, is, is methane um, leak detection and, and repair use case um, and methane mitigation. So this is something I touched on um, earlier when I talked about our, our Tanager satellites and, and the driving use case. So we will be um, processing for customers that are interested in looking for methane. We will be processing our imagery to look for methane and to be able to give our customers a quick look, as we call it, um, at whether there is methane in their area of interest um, within a few days after collection. And so the idea is that this can really support users that um, have an area that they want to understand um, and be able to you know, take quick action against if there is methane um, and we can help support our users in, in understanding um, if there is methane there or not that they need to follow up on. So um, we will be identifying methane plumes um, above our detectable threshold um, within, um, and we'll have our, our 30 meter pixel um, resolution. Um, I think something to, to note here is um, coming back to this idea of the, the power of planets, different sources of imagery. Um, something I think is really exciting um, and valuable is thinking about um, our ability to detect methane plumes and in combination with our other data sources. Um, so you can see this example workflow on the right. You see an um, example methane plume um, from our Tanager satellite um, as we anticipate it looking. Then you can take this and overlay it onto a contextual base map from PlanetScope. We have PlanetScope imagery um, daily across our land masses. So knowing that there is a methane plume is less useful if you don't have that context to understand where that plume is coming from. Um, so you can use that contextual base map to understand that. And then we have our, our high res imagery from our SkySats and um, soon to be from our Pelicans as well. Um, and so if a customer um, wants to refine their understanding of where that methane plume is coming from, they could then task our high res satellites to follow up um, and get a really um, detailed look at what's happening on the ground um, so that they can send their, their workforce in the right places um, to start addressing that, that leak that they found. Um, so really thinking about the layering, the different types of imagery um, on top of one another um, to really take and drive action. 
So with that, I will um, hand it over to Keely to talk a bit more about um, some of the science work we're doing and, and some more about applications. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, so Sarah, I think gave us all a really great background on the Tanager satellite and the instrument itself. And I'm gonna talk just a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing pre-launch to help facilitate our product development to get early feedback from potential customers. And then also just to kind of start kicking the tires a little bit on different types of data acquisitions and different potential applications we might uh, be able to support with data collected from Tanagers. So we've been working pretty heavily in the synthetic data space here with partners at RIT, at Riverside Research and at a company called Rendered AI that specializes in synthetic data as a platform. Um, what we've done with those groups is create a very large synthetic scene that uses a land cover base map uh, and basically gives us a the opportunity to put a faux Tanager satellite and create simulated acquisitions over that synthetic scene, giving us a wide array of data cubes that we can use to explore different questions, and mainly that we can use to help uh, finalize the specs of our different core imagery products that Sarah mentioned, as well as start to develop and test out parts of our data processing pipeline in-house. Sarah, next slide, please. So we built this very large synthetic scene, uh, as I mentioned, in a partnership with RIT, Rendered AI, and Riverside Research. And uh, we did this by using a land cover map that was part of the uh, Denver Regional Land Use Cover Project. Uh, and so this project used a aerial imagery as well as LIDAR data to create a really fine spatial resolution land cover map. And we decided to use that not to try to accurately uh, and perfectly recreate Denver, but as a very good realistic scene where we've got a lot of different types of materials and we have the opportunity to bring in a lot of spectral um, signatures and then distribute those on the landscape of our synthetic scene in a realistic way. So we sourced spectral signatures from existing deer sig scenes and libraries um, as well as publicly available data like the EcoStress library, libraries that different research groups have uploaded to the EcoSys uh, library system, and built out this scene that has over 1,500 unique spectral signatures as part of it. Now, once we've got that scene in place, uh, we can add an atmosphere on top. And so we're using something called the Four Curves Atmosphere Plugin that's part of the DeerSig Radiative Transfer Model Packages. And we essentially can then change what the atmosphere looks like over the top of our synthetic scene. Sarah, next slide, please. So we can set up all of the other imaging acquisition parameters. We can put in a platform that accurately represents the hardware that is the Tanager payload. And from that, we simulate uh, synthetic top of atmosphere radiance. So we basically go through and get this fully simulated acquisition, and we have a data cube from that that we can work with. Um, we can use this, like I said, it, to test out certain parts of our pipeline. So taking it from radiance back to earlier stages of the pipeline, like digital numbers, for example. Uh, we use our internal radiometric models to add the proper types of noise to the spectra. And then we can even do an atmospheric correction with this cube to get a surface reflectance cube. Next slide, please. So here's just a, a few um, examples of what some of those retrieved surface reflectance signatures look like coming from our 30 meter Tanager pixels. And what we can do with this is also test out our different algorithms. We can really debug and understand what's going on at each step of the way. And using synthetic data in this way, Definitely, we always have some, some assumptions. We're using a lot of physical radiative transfer models, but at the same time, we have a deep understanding of the system and how uh, the signal is getting propagated through each part of the system. Sarah, next slide, please. So I will spend just a few minutes kind of walking through some of the applications that we see uh, really being good opportunities for using Tanager data. 
as I'm sure many of you know, um, one of the exciting things about imaging spectroscopy or hyperspectral remote sensing is the sheer number of applications for which the data can be used. Uh, and I always like to highlight this RSE article that I think did a, a really great job um, kind of summarizing all of the different application areas and all the different families of algorithms that have been developed. And the science here uh, is, is really quite mature, and it's exciting to be part of a mission that will make the data more available and accessible, which I think has been a major challenge to really operationalizing a lot of this good science. So um, next slide, we can do just like a, a quick tour through some of these applications. If you're very familiar with hyperspectral remote sensing and applications, a lot of this will be review. If you're new to this area, hopefully it just kind of opens your eyes to all of the different places where we think Tanager data uh, can be of value. Next slide, please. So obviously I think one of the big ones that we've called out the flagship use case for Tanager, uh, which is atmospheric products. So this is methane and CO2 plume detection and delineation, uh, showing some examples here from Carbon Mapper, the nonprofit, about how we can sort of take that and build different levels of data products uh, showing these plumes, showing their change through time, showing concentration, and even source attribution. Next slide. There's also a wealth of uh, applications in vegetation, um, specifically natural vegetation and agriculture. So we can do things like species detection and classification. We can look at changes in fractional cover and subpixel abundance. Um, which are very strongly related to structure. And we can develop models that allow us to estimate more directly biochemical and physiological plant functional traits. Next slide. In the agriculture space, we have like an additional layer of context. Uh, so we could be looking at something as simple as saying what crop type is here. But in cases where you understand what crop has been planted, maybe you have more information about when it was planted, um, what kind of management practices have taken place, uh, you can really start to use hyperspectral imagery to define and differentiate a lot of different aspects. So that could be things like growth stage. It could be things like um, pathogen presence, disease. It could be things like biochemical stress uh, or environmental stresses. And so there's really a wealth of applications in precision agriculture where this data can be applied. Next slide. Uh, one of the areas that we've also looked at a lot with our partners, especially is in aquatic and coastal zones. So thinking about using the spectroscopy data to map things like dissolved organic matter, turbidity, uh, chlorophyll A, tracking things like harmful algal blooms, and even looking at things like bathymetry in very shallow areas. Next slide. In the urban and built environment, there are a lot of exciting applications, uh, building materials, looking at urban infrastructure, uh, using the material and mineral signatures that are present in these places. You have a really high diversity of materials, a high diversity of spectral signatures. And so there are a lot of different questions that you can answer and a lot of different derivative maps that you can make that can be used in a number of downstream applications. Next slide. Uh, minerals is kind of a classic, it was sort of like the, the first use case for a lot of imaging spectroscopy and a lot of the algorithms that have developed for using imaging spectroscopy. And so this is also an area that we're excited about the potential of Tanager data to create uh, mineral presence maps, to look at mineral concentrations, um, and to help better characterize areas that uh, maybe have um, unexplored mineral regions, or even tracking the um, impact of mining operations through time, so environmental site monitoring. Next slide. One that I think doesn't get mentioned enough, uh, but is becoming increasingly important, uh, especially as we think about climate change and ecosystems as they evolve through time, and that's the cryosphere. So looking at applications in snow and ice, um, imaging spectroscopy has been broadly used to map snow grain size, uh, to look at water content in snow, as well as to look at different types of dust de deposition um, on both ice and snow surfaces. 
Next slide. And kind of along the same lines there, um, looking at active wildfires and burned area mappings as well as well as ecosystem recovery trajectories. It's an area where there's been a lot of work done with imaging spectroscopy. On um, the active fire side, um, at a given temperature, we're actually able to model the temperature and the fractional cover of the pixel that is on fire using the signal that shows up out in the shortwave infrared. After an area has been burned, we're able to look at things like charcoal and ash cover, uh, and we're able to really track at a finer grained scale how well an area is recovering after a wildfire. Next slide. Um, I wanted to highlight a little bit beyond just the applications of hyperspectral imagery on their own. And that is that at Planet, we really try to think a lot about data fusion and bringing together a lot of different sensors. So whether those be optical or active um, or radar, and it doesn't matter that they don't have to be Planet constellations, they can be publicly available data, they can be space-borne missions. Um, they can, we even work with other folks who are building small um, CubeSats and launching those. But the idea here is to really to bring together all of those sensors into analysis-ready data layers. Um, and I'll give a, a little plug here for the upcoming analysis-ready uh, data um, ARD23 workshop that's coming up next week. Um, it's really, really important that as we get more and more satellites up and we have more and more sensors on the ground and we continue to evolve payloads and instruments that we can fly on drones or in manned aircraft, that we keep thinking about how we can use all of those data sets together, uh, how we can bring them together into a single cube. And really that's where I think we have the most leverage for answering a lot of these bigger questions. So we call it kind of like thinking up the stack and getting ourselves to a set of derived products that really take advantage of all of the different strengths of those different sensor systems. Next slide. Uh, another thing I wanted to kind of just sh share like a quick example of was something that Sarah talked about previously, and that's the uh, concept of using multiple constellations in a tip and queue format. Uh, so Sarah talked about how that might work across Tanager, um, our doves and um, our SkySats and pelicans. And I thought maybe just giving a, a more specific example here of invasive species could paint that picture a little more clearly. Um, so you can think of we have planet scope from our dove satellites monitoring large scale. Um, we're getting broad swaths of the land, three meter spatial resolution nearly every day. And what that lets us do is have a really good sense of what's changing through time and how we're able to monitor that signal and use that to tip and queue for our other satellite constellations. So for example, um, let's say we're tracking some change in green up in a particular area. We might then come in and say, well, at this particular point in the season, we know we'd have high spectral separability between the native species and this particular invasive species that we're trying to monitor and manage. So we're able to say, oh, great, we're at that right time in the season, go get our hyperspectral imagery. So we can tip and cue Tanager to go and acquire that image that allows us to create a more accurate map of where we see that invasive species. Perhaps then we need to take that a step further. Now we actually want to help support a land management group to go out um, and apply a treatment to those areas. Well, at that point, we might actually want um, our high spatial resolution constellations to come in to really help understand what's the safest and best route of access to get to those areas that we were able to map using Tanager data. Next slide. I thought I'd just finish with um, talking a little bit about planet science programs more broadly. Uh, and we're really excited to bring Tanager into the fold of this program as soon as we're able. Uh, but right now we have over 2,500 publications out there in the scientific literature that use planet data uh, in their research. Over 20,000 registered users across all of our science programs. Uh, and that's over 100 universities worldwide. So planet is 
really, really interested in and excited about continuing to provide data to the research community. Uh, and probably the thing I like most about this slide is just if you'll get the, um, the pie chart, which usually I don't like pie charts, but I like this one. It's a diversity of subject matter areas. I love seeing that there are all of these different disciplines and subdisciplines where planet data is being used to really advance scientific knowledge. Uh, next slide. I think this is my last one here. Um, and this is just like a, a summary of our existing science programs. Um, we've got uh, our education and research program, which is probably the most well-known program. This is typically a degree granting institution, has a, a university license or a lab may have a license. Um, but we also have uh, really strong agreements with the NASA Commercial Small Sat Data Acquisition Program, as well as ESA's EarthNet Program, uh, which allow any researcher who has funding um, through one of those bodies to access parts of our planet data. Uh, so you can see that it's not just planet scope, it also extends into the RapidEye um, archive, as well as SkySat. And we have a couple other programs um, as well that are gaining popularity. Uh, so really strongly encourage you to go to the website and see how to get access. Um, usually people are pretty surprised that they most likely have a path to getting access to planet data, uh, which is something that was not the case when I was in graduate school. It was really difficult to get your hands on any commercial satellite data, um, and it made it difficult to do any science with commercial satellite data. So it's exciting to see how much effort and support Planet has put into really making sure that the scientific community can access imagery from these constellations and use it in their research. And I think that is it. Yep. Thank you so much for your time.